Um, so, <laughs> oh, you know what? Um, Sharif, if, do you think we should show them what the music looks like? I was going to ask, if you wouldn't mind, before we, the first thing that you do, can you t just share with everybody what this piece is like? Like what it looks like, <clears throat> what it presents to you, how much of it you play, what you play of it, Ye why you do that, et cetera? Sure. Um, so I don't know if we can pull these up, but we have um, some visuals of this. But the music that Cage... Uh, wrote for 31 minutes 57.9864 seconds and 34.46776. Those, um, the notes are very, very exact. Every single one is exactly notated. Um, and there's a sort of running line that, or there's a, there's no measure, but there's running along the top um, numbers, and those numbers are the seconds. They actually don't translate into minutes, they just go by seconds. So uh, it might say 1,072.5 you know, seconds, and the next one, 1,078.5. So that's running all the time. Um, there's a, you know, notes throughout, it's sort of spatial, um, there, in that like there's <clears throat> not a meter actually saying that you're gonna count such and such time, but the notes are spaced on the page um, according to that. We'll show you in a second. Above, pointing into, okay. This one is, okay, so this is 31 minutes. This is the one Cage wrote for himself. The one that I was playing on the uh, video Cage composed for himself to play. This so, is the easy one. This is the so-called right. easy one. And <laughs> this is the one I first learned. And it's so fiendishly hard. <laughs> and, uh, but I think actually he says, relatively easy to play. Okay. Um, is there, are you gonna show us the next one maybe? So that's the one he wrote for himself. Um, above the staff, which we'll, maybe we'll see in a, in a sec. Um, above the staff is also, oh, those are, that's I think Yosemite. And <laughs> okay, above, see how above the staff, so this I think is, this is uh, the one he, composed for David Tudor, 40, uh, sorry, 34 minutes. Um, you'll see some of the bars are, are, are some of the stems are stemmed together. James, he says like that doesn't necessarily imply, right, that doesn't imply a legato, but no, what, no, why no. are they linked like that? This is something I'm not totally because sure Because this was part of the composition, so every single event that is on the score was the result of multiple um, chance operation. So Cage described his composing as being asking questions. He went from, you know, thinking of things to just asking questions and getting the answers. And so th for this piece, there's an unbelievable number of questions that are involved for practically every note. But the, in this case, in this piece, the first thing is, well, is it going to be a sound or a silence? And so if it's a silence, how long? If it's going to be a sound, well, is it going to be a single note? Is it going to be some kind of a chord? Or is it going to be a complicated event that has a bit of both of those? And that's what those bars are showing, is where, oh, this is one event that's now spreading out over uh, multiple okay. things. Um, you'll see in the middle, there's, see that A? That is saying that that's an auxiliary, that's a sound that's produced, how would you say, by the body in some well, way? There were, so there's, that's the other kinds of things. So it could be a single note, it could be a chord, it could be a constellation of things, or it could be a noise. And if it was a noise, then the next thing to do is, well, is it a noise inside the piano, right? Right. Inside well, or outside? Yeah, or so A is, a is noise. If you, Sharif, if there's, I don't know if there's another, if, there's, if you see anything that doesn't say transcription or you could just kind of go through. The H over there on the right, that's a harp sound. Right, um, right yeah, inside the piano. Yeah, right. that's, so that means that note is produced on the string. You'll see also, I don't think on this screen, but you'll also see sometimes an I, which means on the inside structure of the instrument you're producing right. a sound, and then the O's mean on the, on the outside. outside. So there's right. an O, an A, uh, sorry, so, O yeah. outside, A, I think of it it's as just a, auxiliary. Yeah, it's auxiliary. Some other kind of noise, and right? then I. I liked your vocals. Inside, did you? Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, and, and that's the way. So David, David Tudor referred to these as the whistle pieces because they always used whistles for, and you did too, because 
your hands are too busy. Right. You, yeah. You got to have something that you can make noise with while you're. It's doing true, and there was one part where you kept the whistle in your mouth for quite a while because your hands aren't free enough to <laughs> take, take it out. Take it out. You just spit it know, across the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to answer your question, this is the long, the long. Um, answer but this so actually what I was looking at is up there this is actually my transcription so I transcribed each note um, and so I have the seconds I actually didn't translate it to um, regular standard clock time really just because I found some bizarre website that actually counts things in seconds and it's been great I hope they never take it down it looks like it's from 1994 but um, so I transcribed it Really because, as you could see, the, the notes are super, super small on most of the editions. Um, so, or, well, sorry, the, the published editions, they're quite small. What's funny is, like, what, when uh, at um, Lincoln Center at the library, they're actually quite big in real life. Yeah, that's because um, Peters reduces them right. to eight and a half by 11. They're oversized scores. Right. And then they're done. And actually, the... Um, when this piece was originally composed, it was composed on these enormous rolls of graph paper. Very long, they're just yards and yards of graph paper, and it was all just graph of the, you know, with like 88 blocks going up for the different notes. And then that was transcribed to that notation, and then now you're transcribing it. <laughs> well, that's what's so, so, I mean, so this is, so what I see is, is this, and the colors that I have are, helping me um, in terms of where on the piano they are, so I don't have to read a lot of ledger lines. So I was just trying to make things readable fast. What's lost, and sort of, so I'm sort of had some soul searching, was the actual beauty of the score, and actually seeing some of those. I mean, I have some ties into nowhere, and I have some sort of, um, some of that. But I am, I'm almost now spending a couple of years with these thinking about how I might have done it differently, how I could actually have blown, re blown those scores up and actually done something similar where I'm writing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, when it's all happening, I'm watching the clock and trying, trying to, to um, it's sort of like, have you ever seen a game show where someone, they put someone in a, like, a machine and the money starts flying around them <laughs> and they're like trying to catch stuff? And you're almost like, why, catch the money, it's in front of you. And it's always funny because like before I ever propose, <laughs> <laughs> Before I ever like um, start practicing these pieces, I always like propo like I proposed it to Tim. I said, "Ah, oh, the, the, these pieces—they're so great." And then I start practicing them. I'm like, even leading up to it, I'll think, "It's fine. The notes are there, and I'll play them." Um, and it just doesn't work that way. Like I'll freeze, and so there's a lot. It's sort of out of mind, though. And I was thinking while playing tonight, I was like, the, the piano transforms under, under the hand. Sort of things get disordered. It happens with Bach, too. Things get so, to, sort of turned around. That's amazing. Well, and I would say that probably, certainly for me, uh, in the audience, it's the same experience, <laughs> right? Just without all the physical stuff. But that sense of like, oh my God, there's all these notes. There's all this stuff that you're doing, and there's absolutely nothing to hold on to. There's absolutely nothing to hold on to, but you try anyway to like yeah. figure out what's going on or what's the, you know, because you're mentally, that's what we do. And this music, because of the way that it's composed, there's nothing but the present moment. There's absolutely nothing but this thing that's happening right now. And, but the, and there's a lot of it. Yeah. I think that for me, that's where the virtuosity comes in, is like your mastery over that space that you're working in, that space of constant now, 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 wherever right. you are. It's, can you say, can you honestly say that from one performance to another, Adam, that your performances are the same? Sort of. Are they getting there? They're getting there. Mm -hmm. And so to, what's, what's interesting is, I'll lie to myself and say that the, the one on the screen is more sparse. There's still wild things that happen, but I'll, what I mean by I'll lie to myself, I'll get, I, I'll practice that and get to the end of a run through and be like, I hit all the notes. That was great. I feel really good. But Sharif, can you actually go back to the, one of the manuscript ones? This is why I'll never, no one will ever play this piece properly. We didn't talk about the dots. Not the dots. <laughs> yeah, that, that's totally insane. Um, so even if, so with the other, perf with the one that was on the video, um, even if I hit every single note, 
at exactly the right millisecond, which of course is not gonna happen. Um, above the staff are all, are three rows, and those rows contain a bunch of dots, and every single one of those dots, see all those dots? So if you were to, see how there's that, see that one that says H, harp, in the middle, right? See how there's one dot in each row above it? Well, each one of those dots is, course, well, it's one note per one dot. So if you were to count all the notes over there, they would correspond to the number of dots in each row above that. So it's three versions. And each row, the top one is the force of your, the, the position of that dot. So see how it's closer to the top? That means I'm not gonna play it very loud. If it was close to the bottom, it would mean I would play it very, or very forcefully. Um, the middle one is um, distance. I think the middle one is distance. Sure. Um, yes. The middle one's distance. James um, just that, said, sure. They, so, when you, so when you saw sometimes this kind of thing in the air, I was really kind of taking at face value some of those places where I thought I could actually do distance. And the bottom one is speed. So the distance, if it's closer to the top, it means you're far, if it's closer. And speed, if, if that speed one in the bottom row, I'm still looking at that one dot. If it's closer to the top, it means you're quite slow. If you're closer to the bottom, it means you're quite fast. So here's the thing. The lie is that I would ever play this piece properly, like play it perfectly, because even if I hit every note, never, ever, ever, ever am I going to also by chance connect every dot and execute it that way. But so what do you think is going I really on here? Wanted, well, I really, <laughs> so I really wanted you to do that so that the audience could get a sense of what it is that you're playing. Right. You know, because what you're doing is a kind of realization of yes. this piece. And you're doing, you're playing as much as you can, as well as you can, as right. quickly as you can, as presently as you can, but, but it's, it's always new. It's space, yeah, it's like realizing a graphic score. Uh, but what makes it really kind of tough for a, tra a classically trained musician, uh, and a perfectionist, <laughs> and poor, poor both of them are, get these emails from me where I'm like soul searching. And the thing is, like, you want to do it right, you know, and because it's not lines, it's actual notes. So theoretically, you want to do it, and so this is what makes it, I think, emotionally kind of a, a wild ride, especially the one that I did live, which really just feels. Um, I use the term backstage, like a free fall. Like you're really in kind of a state of free fall throughout the piece. Do you remember, Adam was alluding to when we did these as a program and James did a pre-concert, which is absolutely fantastic. And we had, uh, I forget, five players, I think it was five players doing five solo works layered on top of each other by chance. It was a 90 minute program. Do you remember that Gary Kvistad did the, whatever it is, 28.79, do you know <laughs> whatever it is? But the point of the point, yes, the number. Do you have 20, the, tw the professor? 26. Is 27. 27, okay. And change. Yes, 27 <laughs> and change piece. But what was interesting about what Gary did was he looked, he had never heard these pieces at all. So Gary, and he's with Nexus, the ensemble, so he's a great percussionist. And he called me up two days after he got the score and said, You know, Lord, there are at least two pieces here you know, inside of it. And I said, I know, I know, I know, it's hard, you know, and you have to really navigate your way. And he ended up, interestingly, putting that, putting his performance half on tape. Yeah. So he basically broke the piece into two parts, changed the instrumentation from what was on tape to what he did live, so, so thereby capturing more of it. But it took two of him yeah. to do that. Yeah, and sometimes this piece is described as for pianists or for two pianists, and I don't, the 34. Mm -hmm. Well, it's... No, the 34 minutes was, it's for one piano, but yeah. he performed them together, they performed them together. So Cage and Tudor did this as a road show, right? This is what they took on tour to, to play. <clears throat> so speaking of it, maybe just a little background of, because there were other people. James, do you want to speak to just the, where these pieces came from and why it's permissible even to layer them like we did today? Right, right. So this these pieces were written... Um, as Cage explained, in, yeah. at some point during the 45 minutes. Uh, these pieces were written between 1953, 1956, the whole series. Um, and it's really, they're extreme pieces because they really are kind of the furthest point that he took that kind of um, 
very, very methodical chants, like where every single note is figured out by you know, answering all of these questions about its various and sundry characteristics. And so what he was trying to do was to work uh, using chance processes to, to utilize as much of the total universe of sound as possible so that you could, you could have a sound appear from, you know, any, any conceivable sound could occur, right? So in the case of the piano, he's trying to understand all of the variables that were involved in playing the piano. The whole animal. The whole thing. And the whole person. And the whole person, right, yes. That's, it's not 34 minutes, 40. It's for a piano. It's, for a, it's, for it's not a for a piano. piano. It's, it's for, for a piano or for a prepared piano. It's for a right. pianist. For a pianist. And the string play piece is, is 26 minutes, 1.14 and 99 seconds for a string player. And it's a percussionist because it was all As about. As he this. says, a four-string player. A, four, a yeah, four-string four four player. Four string player. <laughs> well, because the string pieces actually uh, can be played by any of the classic strings. So it could be violin. It could be cello. It could exactly. Be, as long as it's got four strings, you're good. Um, <clears throat> so those pieces were really projecting into the complete space of anything could possibly happen, which is why it is so totally impossible. It's a really extreme piece. So he had been working his way towards that a number of different systems of chants, and they were getting bigger and bigger in terms of their scope of what could happen. And these were the most extreme, and he realized absolutely anything could happen. Um, the structures of the pieces, they're actually, there are measures under here. There's a whole bunch of four, four bars underneath yeah. it, but you just don't know that. Uh, and I'm not, that's way too complicated to get no, into. No, it's here. wild. Yeah, yeah, there's, um, a, there's a lot of I'll post, I'll it. make a, some, a post on my book, because I, there's, you, he, James writes really beautifully about really what's under the hood um, for these pieces. Um, but they were all, but the structure of them was 100 by 100, which came out to 10,000, which um, is where this idea of calling it the 10,000 things came from. And in his notes, he never actually referred to that set of pieces by that title, but it, he mentions it a couple of times in the lecture that goes with it, which was also built on the same structure. And he, uh, in his notes for the piece, you see that sometimes written there, so you know, he had it in his mind. It wasn't just me. I didn't make that one up. But. And the 45 Minutes for a Speaker, just to clarify, is one of these pieces. Yep. And so it's called 45 Minutes for a Speaker, and it is by far the easiest piece. <laughs> but you know, it's for spoken voice, and you can hear Cage shifting around very fast, whispering, shouting, coughing, Snoring. sneezing, gargling, all of that is all notated in the score. Um, you can... If you, if you buy the book Silence, you can actually read the text read, is in the there. Text is in there. Yeah. Um, one thing, because I want to ask you a specific question, but speaking to, I'm like looking around the room at pianists I know, and again, I'm, it's triggering like a kind of shame. <laughs> <laughs> well, what else what? is new? What is it? Well, what? Adam, you should, <laughs> no, Adam, be, you should, just, you should <laughs> never have shown it, the score. Actually, we need a know. couch. Um, I'll just, no, um, because, I, because of the sense of the realization of a, of a piece. Um, and, and really, as, he, as Cage says in 45 Minutes for a Speaker, is it everything is always, something is always going wrong? Right, something like that. Something yeah. is always going wrong. Basic, and I think it's amazing to build a piece where something is always going wrong. And you could run with that metaphor tonight all you want. Right, and um, I'm getting nowhere. Yeah, and pleasure. going And it's a pleasure. And it's a pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, so there was leading up to this, like as leading up to actually performing the piece. And this tonight was the first time I've ever done, I've, over the last couple of years, I've done the one I did live, but in chunks, I've separated by the structures and done maybe 10 minutes. But anyway, I started thinking, you know, maybe I should have like intelligently, like meaning intelligently, like take, find things I can take out. Like, maybe I'll do half of what's on the page. Like, somehow trying to make it manageable. So systematically sort systematically, of Systematically, yeah, so that I'm not like a mess up here, you know? Um, you and then I could like say... You don't look like a mess. Well, that's, I mean, that's, so I was, I was watching you tonight, and I was thinking about the fact that you were every bit as virtuosic for me as, say, another hero like Polini. So I used to love to watch Polini play and hear Polini play, of course. But the point was is that you were every bit as virtuosic. And I was thinking about the difference between you doing this piece and then Polini doing, say, Beethoven. In Beethoven, I knew all the notes. Like, I knew all the notes that he was supposed to play, and he played all those notes. Right. 
And for you, you're picking and choosing in real time, really quickly. Now, I realize you get some right. habits going and you've got some little riffs that you've, you've mastered and you love. And I get <laughs> she that. can tell. She knows she, me no, way no, too. No. Yeah. But that's good. That's good. <laughs> this is the part he likes. But uh, you know what I mean. Right. So no, yeah, I get it. The, yeah. the mastery is the same, I think. It's just one is, is more... Um, circumscribed and this one's not like you want to make it more like Beethoven no well that's the thing so I <clears throat> to kind of bring it to bring it back I I made peace actually with this uh, and my practice of the piece has actually been to go through it and feel okay with failing all the time and that was really what it, my practice was was to get be start to settle into that feeling without panicking um, but what I think is interesting is that cage cage is recording and I want to hear about this recording but it goes to 46 minutes and that really was so inspiring to me <laughs> because I started thinking what if he took notes what if he took some of the words out and fit it to 45 would I get the impression of that piece and so 40 this the one I did live is so active I don't want it to look like 31 which is less you know I want the identity profile but it, it'll still, it'll be a lifelong work in progress, and I might go back to this actual score and figure out a way, but I want, well, I'm curious about you, the 46 minute well, I'm gonna tell performance. You about this, let me tell you about this tape, because it actually addresses two things that you're talking about, okay, good. which is kind of fun. <laughs> so this tape, so Cage, we didn't find this out, or I didn't know this, until after Cage died, when we started the Cage Trust, and we came upon cassette tapes. And they were clearly cassette tapes that Cage had m made at home. It, they looked like and sounded like things that he just sat at his little table because he realized, oh, I don't have a recording of lecture on nothing. Oh, I don't have, meaning a professional right. one. So we have all these just, you know, simply marked cassettes. You called me up. Laura, when does this date from? We have no idea. None. My guess would be sometime in the early 80s. That's kind of my guess. But anyway, the, I'm going to just tell you a little silly story. And that is that, so we had this tape and it wasn't very good. Way, way less good than what you're hearing tonight. So we sent it out. I'm not going to name any names in this story. We sent it out with the score to um, you know, an audio engineer to tidy it up for us. And it took forever. I couldn't figure out why this was taking so long, because it was really just noise reduction that we were looking for. Anyway, it came back, and he said, I cannot tell you how hard this was. I mean, I can't believe all those extraneous sounds. God. <laughs> Ow. I looked at him and I just went, oh, that's great, that's great. <laughs> now, luckily we had the original, he, you know, he didn't it's touch that it. and we, you know, we just <laughs> threw the, his copy away and sent it out. And then the second one, this, but I mean, this stuff happens. We did 433 once in a program at Bard and the audio engineer, it was on a program who was recording the entire two hour program beautifully. When the guy sat down, it was George Quasha the beautiful, beautiful, surrealist poet. He sat down and performed 433, and the audio engineer turned off the tape recorder, just, just leaving it blank, and then turned it back on when the next player came on. <laughs> so these things still happen. I mean, it still happens. Uh, <laughs> but the, going to your 46 great. minutes. So in the program that we did together at Bard, um, I did 45 minutes for a speaker. And um, someone at Bard was going to be doing 45 minutes for a speaker on a different program later that week. I remember that, mm -hmm. yeah. And she came to me and she said, that was so great. You know, I'm a little nervous about, you know, mine. And I said, well, you know, just practice a lot, you know, and, you know, you can do it. I said, w you know, how are you doing on your, your sounds, your auxiliary sounds? And she said, oh, I'm not doing those. If I do that, it'd be really long. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so some people just drop out the auxiliary sounds. Interesting. So, so, yeah. And and just to you know reduce your guilt. I mean, Cage says <laughs> this is what this the, is about. <laughs> I'm so glad you came. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This, this is you were getting a little Oprah. -like I know. You know? <laughs> but he says in the score, <laughs> it's okay. He says in the score, right, that you can play the score in any. Focus, right. That's right? actually important to know. Right. He, he says that these kind of escape hatches right. uh, that that keep you. Um, <clears throat> which I was thinking about today. That this is a, a great thing because he does this in the score because he realizes full well that this is pretty, you know, absurdly difficult music. Right. Even for 
for David Tudor. And that's the other thing is you've got this, you know, well, this god and that's you know, why pianist I'm, that you're, you're, everybody aspires to when, when they play this kind of music, which, you know, who knows? There's no recording, to my knowledge, uh -uh. of Tudor playing this piece. He really wished, that was the one piece, when I talked to him in the 80s, he was like, you know, he, he wasn't doing piano anymore, but this was the piece he wanted to do for Interesting. recording again. <laughs> Right before we started, Laura, when they arrived, Laura said, you know, someone just recorded 40 or 34 minutes. And I was like, what? What does it sound like? <laughs> so, of course, I started. But, um, she, but yeah. She recorded it with 45 minutes for a speaker, her performing both the piano and the Oh, she piece. was performing yes, it? Yes, oh, she does I thought, them both. Oh, I'm I didn't, sorry. Did oh that just make God. you really unhappy? That probably just made I'm even more really triggered now. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I'm but so sorry. you know he, but he does. Yeah, puts two two escape hatches. To, I mean, there might be more, but there's the where thing, and read it in any up. focus, and where impossibilities occur, the pianist may use um, their discretion. And so I also was looking up what is to, how do we what is discretion? Like how can we <laughs> define discretion? Um, um, maybe just before maybe I know we're running out of time, but um, I would love for you to see the scores for zero minutes and zero seconds, which was interesting. I don't know what you all heard, because what I hear up here is very different. I have, you know, I don't know. Could you tell what well, was going on? Well, well, I knew what was going on, so. <laughs> um, so it doesn't, doesn't do you want to talk? Were, I'm really <laughs> fascinated by how much, James, you like, like this piece. I loved, I because this I, think piece. Of, I think of James, and this is totally a creation of my own, is, He's such an expert on the notes on the page. Like he really, again, went under the hood of these pieces that it's like indecipherably difficult to figure out. And yet, he I taught Cage about a lot of the pieces. Right. After the fact, really. When Cage had to, well, tell. I mean. Well, no, yeah. He by the time I started studying this stuff in the '80s, yeah, he had forgotten how he did all that stuff. So, <laughs> so. So he leaned on James. He yeah, literally yeah, called him up and said, yeah. "Can you explain this one to me?" Yeah. So with that in mind, I was really s delighted to hear, because a lot of people I think would look at, this is the score for zero minutes, zero seconds, it's a, it's a set of instructions. Um, well, yeah, it's and James really liked, and when you said you have a place, a really special place in your heart for this piece, I was really happy to hear that, but I'm curious about why. So, <laughs> <laughs> Because it seems so like this is the height, I mean, dedicated to Yoko Ono, you know, like, yeah, right, it right, seems right. like the height of conceptual so, cage. So this, this piece is called Zero Minutes, Zero Seconds, which is a reference to the fact that it's essentially unmeasured and untimed. So it's, in a way, the almost exact opposite of what is going on in 34 minutes and some odd seconds, which is one of the reasons I really like this piece, because it appears in 1962, so not that long after that. Mm -hmm. But Cage has written all of this music in the 50s that's about all of these very precise measurements and very, very complicated things. And then turns around with this piece, which is basically the score, is the single sentence that says um, in a- This is the score, this yeah, is the whole yeah, score. Yeah, this is it, it's one sentence. It's in a situation provided with maximum amplification, but no feedback, uh, perform a disciplined action. So in Adam's case, it was Take, every, take all this stuff out of the piano, right? And everything is, is amplified. And then there's an additional bunch of little statements of modifiers to that, which I was thinking about today. It's very interesting that, you know, we always think about Cage having these escape hatches. These actually further narrow your choices. Right. They're all limitations. It's a very uncage thing. We don't t typically think of him as restricting your choices, but every one of those qualifications are things like can't be a piece of music, right. Not you can't do that have been done before. before, can't do the same thing <laughs> twice, right. don't pay any attention to the situation at hand, uh, allow interruptions. You know, you got to do this, you got to do this. It's got to, it's got to fulfill an obligation. Right. Uh, you know, he's really so that has always interested me about the piece, but I, I won't get into that. It's also called four minutes and thirty-three seconds, number two. So this is considered also a silent piece, and it, but it's a silent piece that's about action, whereas four thirty-three was written as a score of like it's this, right, right, these right. durations. It was more a nineteen fifties version that is about measurement, right? It was adding up a lot sure, of little sure. silences. The only time but this I piece ever heard Cage do this, did you ever hear him do this or see him do this? I don't think so. Maybe at Wesleyan, I don't remember. Because I saw him do it twice and both times he was writing. 
Right. So both times, like one time it was at Lincoln Answering Center, correspondence he or was uh, working on the Harvard lectures. Mm -hmm. So he literally was amplifying the sound of his pencil right. and paper mm -hmm. and turning pages. Yeah, it's interesting. And uh, fulfilling, by the way, a, a, a an commitment to, to, right. to a public right. lecture. Right, right. And I know that there were performances in the 60s that he did where he would, he would answer his correspondence on a typewriter. And so he had this very, um, uh, while sitting in a squeaky chair. Yeah, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've seen Carefully people do. Chosen <laughs> squeaky chair. I've seen right. people really ham it up, too. And, yes, and, and, and that, it's also, you're that, really not supposed no, to that's do just that. totally wrong. So it is actually a really difficult piece because you're really not you're just supposed to do the work that you would do anyway, just amplified. Right. Right? Which um, you did beautifully, uh, right? Well, um, so, you. But you just, <laughs> that you, one really have to, you really have to just do what it is you're going to do. Yeah. It's because it's silent. And not perform. It's, it's, it's a silent piece, right? Yeah. And um, one more, I just want to show you, I don't even know if we'll have, maybe if you, if you have questions, you can talk to us after, because I think we'll be running out. But I want you to see the score also for one. I and thought maybe, that was beautiful, by the way. Oh, I thank you. So you know what's interesting? Yeah, you know. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, so one, uh, as you'll see in a second, Cage has um, these systems of music, and they're bracketed within mostly, except for the in this case, except for one, flexible start times and flexible end times. Um, it's a little cut off, but you'll see like. The second system starts at 1 or 1.45. It ends somewhere between 1.30 and 2.15. And the, other, the next one starts somewhere, and there's a little bit of overlap allowance there. Um, there's rules to this piece, too. I don't know. It might actually be... Shar Sharif, can you go th to th maybe... A, there might be performance notes. Anyway, you can, the, person, the pianist can execute each line independently. The chords have to go in that order. As you see, each one has um, a dynamic marking, so those are also not left up to, ch to choice. Um, and they can go, they have to go in that order and they can happen really with any relation to each other. Um, but the, what's really, and you'll see parent, that parenthetical notes, that's because there's a little overlap between the lines of actual physical notes. So if you're playing one in the other line while you happen to get to... So these are, have, this is an example of a piece called a number piece. So Cage wrote 143 number pieces. He started these around 1984, at least this kind of notation in his Your Operas, one and two, his first opera. But really, pretty much from that date forward, he only wrote number pieces, pretty much. And they all used this time bracket notation, which has mostly uh, fixed materials, but they're open in time, in terms of the, the, the sequence, uh, not sequence, but the duration and the way that they're played. Right, and the, um, and the numbers, so I, one thing I thought that was very beautiful was after 10,000 and all that stuff going on, it was mm -hmm. so beautiful to come down to one, yeah, right? I yeah. loved it. Yeah, so that, was, that was just where I needed to be. <laughs> but also with the, with the numbers, it's not um, having spent some time uh, earlier today up on the sixth floor in the ohm room, you know, it's mm. not that kind of one, right? It's right. actually so not, yeah, explain it's actually title, not maybe. one meaning, you we know, are unity, one. But all that. <laughs> right. No, the, the, this whole series of pieces, the titles are simply the number of players. So it's really just a head count. Right. Yeah. And, when, and when there's another one for one player. It's then one a with, a, with a super script. To so like the one, second. One, two, one, yeah, three, three, one, four, up to <clears throat> one, thirteenth. Yeah, 113. In practicing this piece, uh, this was an ad, another kind of soul-searching dilemma coming up to it. I found that I was still, even, even though I was following the score and trying to challenge myself, I was still falling into habits of when things were occurring. And then I scoured the performance notes for any trace of Cage inviting um, choice. And it, or like or like on or spontaneous and, sp and there, nothing it wasn't there, and I started thinking like what if I actually did a chance operation to determine where these will fall within these time brackets and yada yada yada. But that's just fixing the score. Well, yeah, I and just again I won't name any names, but there's a conductor who does that with the large <laughs> number of pieces. Oh, yeah. Well, I found out that he like rewrote the the number pieces into fixed scores oh. for his orchestra, to which I said. Well, it's kind of a, contrary to the point. He goes, oh, they can't play it otherwise. Oh, but that's so wild. So, <laughs> so now you're going to, so Sharif, if you go to like maybe one of the next ones, you're going to see what I did <laughs> where I totally fixed the score. Um, well, <laughs> 
I don't know if I would do it again, but I thought it was interesting because as I was coming up with the calculations and where things were going, I was like, I hate that. And then I was like, oh, I hate that. Like, I, I, this is what my score looks like. Um, I was like, I would never do that. Right. You know, like, the, things were falling right at the same time, sometimes literally at the same time. And I was like, this is totally not what, what I was... What these pieces are. They're just well, not what the pieces are. But then I was sort of... But then I was like, well, I'm going to just keep going and figure out what's going... And, and play it. And then I just... So, yeah. So that's what I did tonight. I did this. And I, I grew to sort of love it because it was so not my habit. Or it was so avoiding um, my uh, whatever instinct of what I would do. And I actually ended up really loving it. And the last one that I had, it's a 10 minute fixed score. The last number I calculated was at 10 minutes, the actual literal mark, oh, okay. which again is something I would never do. <laughs> so that's why that little pop at the end. <laughs> But, um, the beauty of these number pieces, and I don't think they're fully understood yet in terms of the significance of them, but I was thinking about it tonight that isn't it interesting that they really are like the 10,000 things pieces, if you will, that they can never be performed twice the same way. They just can't. I mean, that is right. their nature. And so it's interesting that I remember when these uh, recordings first started coming out of the number pieces, like I would get a CD in the mail and it would have, you know, uh, somebody would do five on it or something. And I remember feeling sort of disgruntled, you know, like looking at it and going, you know, like what difference does it make? Now I'm gonna hear one realization of this right. piece. And then I remember the first CD that came out that had two on the same one. So it was four, two and four, two done twice. Oh, cool. So you could begin to see you would, the pieces recognizable totally, but it was nuanced so yeah, beautifully. Or, but our four, which it's written that way. Right? Exactly, where you swap it's the where parts. Where you swap the parts, <laughs> exactly. right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. these pieces are just fantastically interesting in that they're subtly different yeah. every time they're played. And I guess when he's writing it that way, he actually, it's prob maybe it's implied that you're making those choices. He doesn't have to say the word. I'll never do this again. What a horrible, no. <laughs> but no. Uh, do you think it's sort of implied after all of this, I don't know, do you think it's implied that the performer's making choices? John Cage said a really beautiful thing in the Alderberg uh, Music Circus film, and he said, some people take the works too seriously, <laughs> and some people don't take them serious enough, and some people play them just right. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, um, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> And this is Tim, thank you. <laughs>